You're listening to The Wild Initiative Podcast Network. Learn more and check out all the shows at thewildinitiative.com. You're listening to the Fish Untamed Podcast, where we talk all things fishing, conservation, and the outdoors. Today on the show, I'm joined by Peter Stitcher, founder of Ascent Fly Fishing. All right, welcome to episode number eight of the Fish Untamed Podcast. Today, I'm joined by Peter Stitcher, founder of Ascent Fly Fishing, which many of you are probably already familiar with. Uh, In a past life, Peter was an aquatic biologist, but ended up taking his knowledge of entomology and fisheries over to start his own company, which um, focuses on building customized fly boxes for uh, a particular time and place. So you can, you know, place an order as a customer and he will go through the trouble of um, taking into account where you're going to be fishing, when you're going to be fishing, and then designing the perfect fly box for you so you um, can kind of take all the guesswork out of it. So this would be great for if you're going to a new place for the first time or you're just getting started in fly fishing and don't really know how to choose the right fly yet. Um, so Ascent can basically just build the perfect fly box for your specific situation. Uh Peter also talks about his pause and match methods, which are acronyms that describe uh, ways to identify which uh, insects you should be imitating when you get to the water, and then also which flies you should choose to match those insects. Uh, And then toward the end, we get into a little bit about secrecy in fly fishing these days. Um, just kind of Peter's thoughts about it. It's a it's a topic that matters a lot to him as someone who you know actively tries to get more people into the fly fishing world. Uh, so he really wanted to talk about kind of the ways that we need to be a little bit nicer to each other as anglers and stop uh, being so tight lipped about some things. So without further ado, here is my chat with Peter Stitcher. Okay, so do you just want to start by telling me a little bit about your background growing up fishing and um, kind of how you got into aquatic biology for the first time? Yeah, so it was actually my mom who introduced me to to fishing. So young kid, oh gosh, I mean, probably three or four with a cane pole in my hands. And we still have, you know, some gritty family videos of me, uh, you know, standing over a, a little trout pond outside of Knoxville, Tennessee. And I mean, that excitement when I was catching that first trout, I, I feel like I still feel it almost to that degree and intensity today um so yeah uh, the river the lake has always just been a place of of joy and release and and anticipation for me and uh, so segueing and and moving into aquatic biology was just a a natural a natural move for me a natural progression so did you grow up primarily fishing for trout and and where did you grow up so yeah we bounced around a little bit but I, i spent most of my time growing up in the midwest and so it was a lot of, uh, you know, bass and bluegill and uh, some seasonal trout stocking. Um, but my grandpa, when he retired, he became a, a ranger in Rocky Mountain National Park. And so we would uh, spend uh, a lot of time in the summer going up to Estes Park, visiting him uh, at the trailhead. And uh, I would get to explore, you know, the St. Vrain, the Big Thompson, uh, Fern Lake, a lot of these these lakes that I now get to, you know, equip my clients to go and fish. That's really, really where I cut my teeth and and develop my my passion and love for fly fishing. That's funny you say that because I I caught my very first trout on the fly in Sprague Lake up in Rocky Mountain National Park. So we probably have a lot of the same uh, haunts up there. Absolutely. Was it a little brook trout? It was. Yep. I was so excited yeah. to catch it. I caught a couple that day. Um, before that, I had only caught uh, trout on spin gear, just some rainbows. So that was my first brook trout and first trout on the fly. So definitely have a special place yeah, in my I, heart. Wow. <laughs> I mean, even a six a six inch brook trout today still gets me excited. But, oh, same. Uh, absolutely, yeah. Um, um, so, then, yeah, I mean, aqu- oh. oh, go ahead. Oh, as I say, yeah, I mean, aquatic aquatic biology wasn't where I started. I was actually um, studying, um, you know, getting my master's in counseling, and uh, found myself, um, you know, looking at the clock and hoping either that my clients wouldn't show up so I could go fly fishing or 
were ready for them to leave so I could I could head back out to the river and and I realized uh that you know I, I should be I should be fly fishing for a living and not uh not sitting in an office counseling people so um yeah I, I find healing on the water and I think uh I mean, it's, it's a great place to, uh, for people to connect with each other and themselves and, and just find some find release find hope um find some silence so it's 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 an awesome sport so did you kind of switch tracks at that point and and start taking classes more related to biology i did um so actually i went back and i got uh, my third bachelor's um so i, I should have just you know looked at kind of where i spent all my time i mean all along i was skipping class for my, my first several degrees to, to go fly fishing and every time something good would happen i'd celebrate on the river or something stressful would happen i'd skip class and go fly fishing so i should have just seen it back then but uh, i went back and went to oregon state studied aquatic biology and uh yeah then you know my first first job as a biologist was surveying salmon water across the, the pacific northwest you know, living out of a tent and uh hiking up to these headwater streams in the middle of nowhere and just living with the fish watching them seeing where they live uh, what makes a healthy trout habitat a healthy salmon habitat just really immersing myself in their world and uh i think yeah that's one of the times i was i was happiest you know way more um you know in my own in my element than than when i was uh counseling people now at this point were you already focusing on the entomology side of of the fisheries or were you kind of you know a generalist or, or into the fish right so as an aquatic biologist um you know there are people like you know engineers and and fluvial geomorphologists, I mean, all these, you know, these specialists that focus on river flow or river habitat. And, and as an aquatic biologist, I am more of a, a general practitioner, uh, as it were. So um, I'm looking at uh, the types of sediment and, you know, what makes up the bottom of this stream. Is it conducive for, for fish to, to, to reproduce? Um, I'm looking at, you know, fish passage and, uh, you know, even going down to looking at culverts, can can fish, you know, bypass this or by this bridge or or by this structure to to get upstream and reproduce. And, and entomology was certainly a, a big piece of what I looked at. Um, so, from healthy uplands and healthy forests to what's happening in that riparian zone, like right along the edge of the river, to what's happening under the water, the water chemistry, I, I looked at all of it. So, but bugs, I mean. From my my youngest days, uh, you know, catching the insects was something I loved, and just uh, yeah, it really connected with just a core of of who I am as a, as an angler. I loved it. Yeah, and I feel like you know, as anglers, we do really we're really fascinated by the fish themselves because that's obviously what we spend most of our time chasing. But you know, it's hard to deny that that that's kind of built around a foundation of all the all the insects in in a river that you you often don't think about apart from just you know, what's hatching right now, I'm going to put it on the end of my line. Right. And I think, um, you know, spending those first two years as a biologist living in the field with, I mean, just one eccentric partner, you know, it, but when the, the clock was done, when we're at the, the camp at the end of the day, I just stayed on the water with the fish and just kind of watching how they feed and, and being out there, you know, year round um, uh, in the Cascades and across the Northwest, I got to see this cycle, this life cycle, and go back to these same rivers year after year and see, you know, you know, I, I've seen this hatch, you know, three months from now or four months from now, but this is what that bug looks like now under the water, and this is what size it is. And so I started to, to see these patterns and really bring that into my fly box and start tying according to what I was seeing on the water and how that shifted from season to season, from watershed to watershed, from region to region, and, and really put those pieces together and you know, what I thought was just a fun way for me, but as I've kind of taken this into the fly fishing world, I see that it's kind of a unique approach to, to the way that people fly fish as well. So do you fi- did you find that, um, obviously, being an aquatic biologist definitely gives you kind of an upper hand when you go fishing, but did you ever find that your experience fishing kind of gave you a head start on becoming a biologist? You know, that, that's, that's interesting. Um, I haven't kind of, you know, reversed it like that before. Um, you know, I, I think there's a lot of biologists. I mean, most of the biologists um, I, I work with, I mean, most of them do fish, but a large number of them didn't. Um, I mean, that is, 
that has always been my driver, um, the, the desire to catch fish, to catch bigger fish, to catch more fish. Um, and then ultimately that passion has shifted to helping other people experience that. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I think it's made me a better biologist um, because there's there's a, a drive other than just the sustainability of these fisheries and, and you know, the future generations of these fisheries. Um, I, I want people, I feel like there's um. It makes it personal. It makes people passionate about it when, when they can catch it, when they can touch it in a way that just observing it, you know, as a scientist. Um, I don't know if that makes sense, but I think it makes me a better biologist and I wouldn't be a biologist without fishing. So it's, it's just tied together in the fabric of, of who I am and yeah, I, I can't see it separated. Right. You kind of have a little bit more skin in the game and, and kind of something more, you know, personal to, to fight for when you're out there, I'm sure. I don't know. I, it's, uh, you know, I, I think that an understanding of the science and kind of the, the inner interaction of, of, of a healthy neighborhood and what we're putting down the drains and how we manage the forest and, and what we do on the trail and how that affects our waters. I think, um, that is going to create anglers that are become, you know, greater advocates for the river that, uh, are more responsible, you know, in their life around the water and, in society. And, uh, I think the science is, is going to make a better angler and a more engaged angler overall. Mm -hmm. So at what point did you start to transition from just, uh, you know, a straight up science role to, to kind of more a helping other fishermen using the knowledge that you gained as a scientist and, and your, your start at ascent? Right. So it was kind of a, a trial by fire, um, just born out of necessity. Um, my daughter, when, after we, we moved to, from the, the northwest of Colorado to, to manage a lot of private water in the Aspen Valley, and um, as a biologist, you don't make a lot of money. You have poor insurance. And my daughter was like one and a half, and we thought she needed a new kidney. So it was, you know, we were hustling. I'm picking mushrooms and selling them to restaurants in Denver. I'm doing everything I can to, to make this extra money to, to pay for this. And, um, I had some friends that were going to fish a specific water and I'm, I'm like, Oh, I did the entomological studies there. Or, you know, on this river, I, I did the restoration work on that ranch just downstream. I know exactly, you know, what bugs are living there. And so I started tying up some, some flies for these friends and they go out fishing and, uh, they come back and report that, you know, they're with X number of, of other anglers and these guys and they outfished all of them. And they're like, hey, you know, I'm going here next. What should I use? And so, you know, hearkening back to what I did is that, you know, a young biologist in the woods in Oregon, I started, you know, looking at those cycles, looking at how those trout feed throughout the seasons. And I started applying that to a couple local rivers, started tying more and more flies. And uh, ultimately, on a weekend doing that, uh, I started making more money than I did in a month as a biologist. So, I thought, and there's, there's something here. This is where my passion lies. And, and, uh, yeah, we went all in, in 2014. And so at this point, did you have a kind of a vision for what it was going to be? And is it the same as, as how it's turned out or is it kind of evolved? You know, initially, I mean, we started with, you know, the, the focus that we wanted to, you know, take all this data, put it into a mobile app that would empower anglers on the water real time. And ultimately that's where we want to go. But, um, ascent fly fishing, you know, our, our kind of our biologist owned and operated fly shop has, has grown to just so much more that we, than we ever could have imagined. Um, in 2014, we had one manager, two fly tires and, you know, we're, we're scratching it together. And now we have 40 full-time fly tires and two factories and so much going on both here and around the world. Um, yeah, it's, uh, it's so much better and bigger than we could have thought. And we have an awesome community that has grown up around what we're doing. Do you just want to describe quickly kind of what Ascent Fly Fishing is? You know, what, what the services you provide are? Right. Yeah. So I think, you know, we're a unique fly shop in that um, we are science forward, science first, and we are about empowering anglers with the education. How do we take the geeky things that I do as a biologist to study and build and manage and transform a fishery and break that down into little tidbits of knowledge and tips and rigs and the right flies that you can tie on the end of your line 
and have the best day ever, you know, every time you go out to the water. And so we tie about 40 to 50,000 flies a week. And uh, we have about 600,000 flies in the shop. And what we specialize in is a client from New York or uh, California or Texas can say, I'm going to fish, uh, you know, the Beaver's Bend River in Oklahoma, or I'm going to the Deschutes in Oregon, and I'm going the third week of July. I have $50. What should I fish? And I'll, we've created this database of invertebrates, of the bugs that live in our waters by region, by river, by watershed, um, by elevation. You know, how does water temperature and snowpack and flows affect the life of these bugs? I mean, we do all this geeky stuff on the back end, but what we send our clients is a fly box that's loaded with the flies that match the families, the life cycles, and the sizes of the bugs on the waters they're fishing, when they're fishing them. So when it comes to, you know, what should I fish? They receive a box that has all of the aquatic life cycles, all the underwater bugs on one page of that box. And there's a mid row, a mayfly row, a caddisfly row, a stonefly row, and as soon as those bugs start to hatch, they come through the surface of the water. Our client can flip that box to the next page. And on that same row are the dry flies of the midges, the mayflies, the caddis, each on their own row. So we simplify and we get them the right fly for their waters every time they fish them. So this is a great time for me to ask about um, one of the topics I wanted to bring up because I've heard you mention it before. And that's the, the fly box organization style that you use. Right. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I, gosh, initially, you know, clients bring in still all the time, they bring in their boxes. I always encourage them, you know, bring your boxes to the shop so we can see what you have. And if you have the flies you need, I'm, I'm going to send you out without selling you a single fly. I'm going to point out, this is what you need to fish today. I'm going to drop a pin on Google maps. You're going to go here and fish it and you're going to have an awesome day. So I like people to bring their boxes over. We see what they have, but most of these boxes are often just a disorganized jumble of, you know, flies that they bought on the bighorn and then some they bought on the Gray's Reef in Wyoming and a couple that they got on this trip to uh, to California. So it's this niche match of, of hatches and life cycles all jammed into a box. And so we've created an organization method and some tools to do that. Um, and so the hatch organization method is what we apply to every single fly box that leaves our shop. Clients order flies, we pack them in this order. So um, essentially, um, we load one page, like a, in a double-sided fly box, one page would consist of all the aquatic life cycles, what the bugs look like uh, underwater. And this accounts for about 90% of the life of the bug and about 80% of fish feeding, you know, averaged over the year. And so, uh, just like a book, on the left-hand side of this page that contains all of our wet flies, the left-hand side of that row is the beginning of the life of each of these different food groups. Uh, the beginning of our midges. We have our midge larva, and as you move across that row, you go from midge larva to our midge emergers. So as you go from left to right across that page, you follow each of these food groups from the bottom of the river up towards the surface of the water. Next rows are our mayfly nymphs to our mergers caddis larva, case caddis and emergers, stone flies, and then on the bottom rows we have our eggs, our scuds, our worms, our streamers, kind of those other important uh, aquatic species. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, this is where, so a client can go to the water, they stay in the water, they sample the water, they can pull a bug off of a rock and they can go right to the row and the life cycle very quickly. And throughout that day, these bugs start to move. The water heats up. Some of them start to hatch. They swim towards the surface of the water. And then we see the fish start giving us feedback. They're moving from maybe feeding on some of these wet flies to some dry flies. They're starting to fin through the surface of the water. They're starting to splash. We see bugs getting picked off the surface of the water. And that's our cue as anglers. It's time to change courses in the meal. And we flip the box over. So just like on the wet side of the box, each row kind of represent a different family and food group on the water. You go back to the top row on the second page, and there are our adult midges, our dry midges, and then our dry mayflies, and our dry caddisflies, and our dry stoneflies as we move down through that box. So again, it's just a book. 
you know, one page is, is the breakfast menu. The second page is the lunch menu. And the intent of this is not to be OCD, but it's to empower anglers to quickly get to the water, match what the fish are feeding on, and then just by running their finger across the row in their fly box, they're staying in front of those fish as they're progressing through the day, through the, the courses in the meal. They're having a great time. They're catching more fish. And, uh, yeah, they're not buying flies that they already have in their box. They know what they have. Yeah, I think that's a very important thing to address if if you do have a box that's kind of disorganized is that you may be looking for a fly that you have and not be able to find it or vice versa. You might keep um, thinking you're out of a fly and keep buying more when, when it's there the whole time. And there's there's obviously many ways to organize a fly box, but this is just a very logical. Um, you can get to what you need right when you need it. And if, if you know, the listeners have a method that makes sense for them and they've been doing it, by all means, keep doing it. You know, it's, it's not about my way is not the right way, but this is just what I observed, in, you know, years in the field, just watching these fish feed and, and watching these bugs grow. Um, so it made sense to set up my boxes like this. And we've created a, a movie. It's called Creating Order in Your Fly Box. And that's available on like DVD or, or they can stream it uh, online um, as well. Perfect. We can we can link to that in the show notes as well, so people can just click that there and follow it. I did have one question about um, that this fly box organization style. What it, I'm just going to use the example of mayflies, for example. So you're reading left to right, and you're going from your your smallest nymphs up to like a like a mayfly spinner, let's say. Um, mm-hmm. But you've got a lot of different mayflies. So you might have some generic ones, like some some parachute atoms. Then you might have BWOs and PMDs and drakes and all kinds of mayflies. Right. So do these take up multiple rows? Do you organize them by, okay, the top row is going to be the entire life cycle of a BWO, and then below that's a PMD, or how, how do you handle that? Great question. So I would say probably 60 to 70% of the anglers that come into our shop, they're probably like a single box angler. And okay. it might be a large box, or they might have some of these little, the little uh, fly pucks that they get at the shop but most of their bugs are jammed into one box. Um, so I encourage people, you know, be real estate poor and just really pack those rows with the flies you have, uh, as opposed to having six boxes you have to shuffle through on the water to try to find the right flies. Mm-hmm. If you do have more flies, like it sounds like you do, and I mean, I certainly carry too many bugs with me on the water, you can dedicate this method and really, you know, flesh out one box that's dedicated to mayflies. And so, yeah, I will, um, you know, group together flies of a specific pattern. My pheasant tails are together. My juju betas are together. My hare's ears are together. Um, so some of those generalists, those flies like the parachute atoms and the pheasant tail, you can use that fly in a couple of sizes, maybe match 20 different mayflies on the water. It's just the renaissance man of the river. And so, you know, I'm going to clump those together. When we get to what I would consider a true fly pattern, some patterns that are tied to match a specific hatch. So like a PMD, um, I'm going to clump those, those patterns together. Um, but yeah, so within my boxes, I'll have my green drakes clumped together, my blueing olives, my PMDs. And then we have maybe a, a block of those generalists, like the parachute atoms and whatnot. And then there might be a block of kind of flashier, sexier attractor patterns, the royal wolves, the purple hazes, the humpies. They have that mayfly profile, wing, and tail, but again, they're not actually matching a specific bug. They're just meant to, to stand out of the crowd and, and really snag the attention of the trout. Mm-hmm. So the boxes you send out from Ascent, um, basically people can custom order a box to fit their exact fishing needs on, a, on an exact location and time. Uh, this isn't like a subscription fly box. This is, this is a specific order tailored to the customer, right? It is. It is. Uh, Right. Um, you know, there's a lot of really cool subscription services out there. And, um, but potentially, I mean, you could be getting flies for a hatch that's a thousand miles away from you and those flies aren't going to pertain to, to where you're fishing. So we can get, we can get detailed. We can go down to, you know, this specific lake or region or, or river for, you know, within these two weeks. And we have enough data for some of these waters that, I can even line out the flies by the half an hour of a day. Um, wow. It's so predictable and measurable um, based on the water temperature at that elevation on that water. 
I can tell you where in the hatch these flies are going to be, and you can just, you know, change your flies by your watch. Some, you know, most of us though are like, God, I hope I get to go fishing this summer, or maybe I get to go out fishing this fall. And so for clients like that, they can say, here's my budget. I'm a beginning angler and I would just want to fish in Colorado and Wyoming and I'm going to fish spring, summer, and fall. I'm not going to fish in the winter. So we'll take more of a 10,000 foot view and based on their budget and their preferences, um, you know, we can get them the flies for that as well. Yeah. And this sounds very, I mean, even like you said, for the, for the beginner angler who just kind of wants a head start on, on their fly selection. But also I think this is, it just sounds really useful if you're going on a trip somewhere that you haven't been before. And it's like, I know, I know my fly selection, you know, on the money for, for Colorado basically year round. But if I, if I were to head down to, you know, the Southeast or on a saltwater trip or something like that, I don't know if you guys do saltwater flies, but you know, I would feel completely lost in that, in that situation. And I'd love to have someone, you know, basically custom tailor a selection for me so I didn't have to, to worry about it. Absolutely. And, uh, yeah, there's, there's no hard sells. And, um, yeah, we just actually bought out another shop. So I'm, I'm in my office right now as we do this, uh, this podcast and I have 1500 dozen saltwater flies right next to me. So we are uh, getting into that. Um, but yeah, right now I have a, another client I'm working on. Uh, I'll wrap it up this evening. Uh, he ordered a, a $200 box for the South Island of New Zealand. So, um, we have data for New Zealand, Patagonia, the entirety of Canada and the U.S., and uh, and then we're starting to get a lot of good data and bugs tied up for uh, mainland Europe as well. So um, we're really trying to, to take the guesswork out and just help people get to the river with confidence, know what they have, help them match it quickly, and catch more fish. Now, there's one more uh, topic kind of related to ascent that well, and it's not really directly related to ascent, but but kind of the work you do in in c- catering these fly boxes to people um, before we get into the the main subject of the conversation, and that's your um, pause and your match methods. Right, right. Um, so, yeah, it's it's about simplifying. So, I, we found that it's it's easy uh, it's easier for anglers to have a couple kind of phrases or acronyms that as they approach the water, they can, you know, kind of, you know, recite this little acronym to themselves so they can quickly go through and look at the water and around the river and start collecting the data that's going to help them, you know, match the hatch. Where are they going to match the hatch and how can they do that quickly? And we've, we've fleshed this out, um, you know, on our website, we have blogs and videos and, and a lot of good stuff that really goes into a lot of depth on this. But our method is we encourage people to pause P-A-U-S-E, before they match, M-A-T-C-H. And pause stands for the five points where the menu is written. These are the five places that we're going to look as we're leaving our truck at the parking lot and walking to the river as we move up and down the water throughout the day. And that's where we're going to get this definitive menu. And then based on that information that we collect in those five points, how we're going to prioritize that is going to be match. So let's work through pause first. And uh, yeah, I'll, uh, you know, stop me if you got questions, um, but I'll I'll delve into it. Sounds good. P stands for parking lot to the river. And so matching the hatch starts on the walk. We're not tying flies on at the truck. We haven't even gotten to the restaurant yet. So we have no idea what the fish are eating in the parking lot. But what we're looking for are grasshoppers kind of evacuating the trail or ants and beetles crossing over the trail. We're listening to the chirp of cicadas and crickets, and all of this is going to help to inform, you know, maybe these different terrestrials are going to be on the menu when we get to the river. What's stuck on the grill of our truck? Are there a bunch of grasshoppers on there? Well, we were driving along this river. Maybe we'll be fishing grasshoppers. So we're listening. We're watching. As we get to the edge of the river, we're looking for the shucks or skins of those stoneflies that have hatched out of the water and they cling onto the outside of a rock or a boulder on the edge of the river, and they leave that little crunchy exoskeleton there. That's a clue to us. Maybe stoneflies are present. We're, we're pushing our way through the bushes. We're shaking the, the trees to see what gets kicked loose. So that's P in our pause method, parking lot to the river. A stands for above the water, and from 200 yards away, what I'm looking for are swallows, those small darting birds that are ducking and diving low over the surface of the water. And uh, 
swallows at the surface of the water means a hatch is just starting or insects are returning to the water to lay eggs. So trout will rise after a fly to feed on it as it hatches. Swallows will meet that hatch at the water and feed on these insects as they come off the river. That's so a great visual cue. Dry fly actions in progress. Um, also, our different families of insects, mayflies, have this very even wave-like dance upstream and then reverse course in this wave-like motion downstream. Caddisflies, from a distance, they swarm in this chaotic kind of cluster. No, no dancing, no synchronicity, just chaos. So if you see chaotic swarms, you think caddis. And then our stoneflies are like a Black Hawk helicopter on a mission, very straightforward, coming down hard and hot. I mean, you'll feel stoneflies crash land into you before you see them sometimes. So based on the, how the swallows are flying, based on how the bugs are flying, that's going to inform also what dry flies might be working. Parking lot to the river, that inform dry flies, as does what's above the water, how these bugs are flying and how the birds are inter interacting with the water. A, um, and then now we go to you, under the water. And sampling under the water, I can't, like, you know, say enough how important it is to just stop for one minute, two minutes, and sample under the water. This is where 80% of fish feeding is happening. Right now, as we enter the winter, it's going to be 95% of fish feeding. So entire pages of the menu are, like, literally at your feet. You just need to bend over and pick it up. And so we use uh, the river oracle like sci-fly seine. A seine is just a fine mesh screen that wraps around your landing net. Push that down against the bottom of the river with your basket and this fine mesh net facing up into the current. And then you take your wading boot and you just crush it into the bottom of the river upstream. And you're kicking over boulders. And you're really stirring up the bottom of the river. And in doing so, you're washing all the aquatic insects off the bottom of the river up into the current and they drift down to get trapped in the mesh of this seine. So when you pull that from the water, you have this detailed menu. This is the most abundant. These are the sizes. These are the colors of the bugs. This is what is on the menu. It was just sitting there and it's super easy to pick up. So that's what we're really spending most of our time looking at. And all of those bugs that we sample under the water are going to be translating to what's on the wet pages of the wet flies, the nymphs, the larvae, the pupa patterns in our fly box. Um, P-A-U-S stands for spider webs. Uh, spiders know exactly what's hatching on the river. They've been sampling all night, all day. And if you have a, a spider still hanging out in a web and insects that are still stuck in that web, that's a very fresh sample of what's flying and hatching and hopping around the river. So we can hold up a fly box our dry page next to that spider web. I did this with my daughter when she was four and she's like, dad, there's 14 midges and one caddis fly in there. And I asked like, Emily, what should we fish? She's like, well, duh, dad, we should fish a Griffith's gnat because <laughs> she ties her own flies and she's four and she's no, she, she gets it. So what do the spiders have? That's what's hatching right now. That's fresh. That's on the menu. Let's, let's tie that on. And then E stands for edges and eddies. So as a river wraps its way through a landscape, we're going to have root wads and log jams and islands and boulders. And just the, the curve of the river, we're going to see these swirling uh, eddies of foam and current. And what happens is they get, you know, this, this current gets trapped in there. And within that current, all of the bugs that have tried to hatch or that have returned to the river to lay their eggs or have fallen in the river as they've gotten kicked off the shore, they get trapped in that swirling foam. So if we break that seine back out, sweep it through the foam, there's a great sample of the dry flies that might be working. And that current and that eddy reaches all the way down to the bottom of the river, kind of like a tornado. So we break our seine back out, scrape it through the bottom of that current, we get an extra wet sample of what's happening under the water. So that is the pause method. That's where we, we grab the data that's going to help us mass the hatch and be effective. Now, that's just super important, too, because, you know, as much as I know that I should be looking at what's hatching and, and what's in the river I'm fishing, 
you know, it's, it's so easy to drive up somewhere and just be so excited to get out. And you're like, I, f- I know what I fished here last time. I'll just throw something on, you know, at the, at the trunk of the car and head down. And, you know, it could be completely different than it was last time you were there. Right. I mean, it's, it, it is going to be completely different. I mean, you know, what, what I'm picking in my garden in the spring is going to be different than what I'm picking in my garden in the summer and in the fall. And the menu changes in the river just as regularly. Um, and, uh, I mean, it's, it's awesome to be enthusiastic and want to get out there and fish, but I want people to have the best experience possible. And, I mean, local fly shops, they're a great resource for getting some of that information, but I want to build independent anglers. You know, you, when you give a, what they say, you give a man a fish, you feed him for a day, uh, you, you teach a man to fish, you feed him for a lifetime. Well, we're all catch and release anglers, I hope, but, I mean, it, it applies. We want to teach people to fish. So this can be a passion and a pursuit for a lifetime. Right. And it feels more satisfying, you know, when you get to figure it out, there's, you know, there's something fun about showing up to the water and just immediately catching fish, but it's also fun to have to kind of go through a couple of patterns and, and then realize like, oh, that's why this one's working. And the last three I tried did not work, you know, because you, you found something in the water that, that kind of keyed you in on what you were supposed to be fishing the whole time. I mean, the, I, I agree with you. I think there is a, uh, a unique satisfaction and engaging the trout and engaging nature and really coming down into it, into the trenches and and being one with that. But I mean, I also, um, you know, I have no judgment if people want to take a guided trip every time and have people tie on their flies. That's awesome too. I'm just, I'm happy to see people on the water, but I think uh, if they want to try it, they will find, you know, a deeper joy in, in, you know, engaging that, outsmarting that fish. Um, it, it's a unique pleasure for sure. And right before we get to the um, kind of the rest of the talk about secret spots, do you just want to quickly go over the match method as well? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, with the pause method, we've kind of reassembled this menu that's been floating around the river and flying around the river and we put it into our fly boxes. Now we're looking at these these beautifully organized rows that are organized by hatch and life cycle. And we have to determine out of all these hundreds of flies, or if you're like me, all these thousands of flies I have with me, what do I fish? So match M A T C H of utmost priority. First thing we're looking at is what was the most abundant. Um, if we go into a, uh, a restaurant and you know, they say we have a hundred burgers uh, today and we have one steak. Well, we all might like to eat that steak, but most likely, if you look around, you know, most everyone's getting a burger today. So we want to start by throwing the burgers. What was the most abundant? So if I'm looking in my seine and I see 100 little blueing olive mayfly nymphs, and then there's two big steaks, there's two big golden stone flies, maybe, you know, a couple big caddis larvae, what the trout are most likely seeing the most of and having the greatest opportunity to eat Um, throughout the day is going to be those mayflies. There's more of them than everything else. So we're going to prioritize what we're seeing the most of. Um, A stands for approximate size and profile. Um, Each of our flies in our box have a unique profile to match the families and the life cycles that they're imitating on the water. A mayfly nymph on the water has short antennas and really condensed legs on the thorax and three distinctive tails on a long abdomen. Our mayfly nymphs in our fly box, the patterns, all of our mayfly nymphs are going to have legs and they're going to have tails or they're going to have a little thickened thorax. They're very close in size and profile. So if we're seeing a bunch of size 22 nymphs, we're not going to typically tie on a size 12. We want to get close to what's actually in the water. We're not going to throw Godzilla out there. So approximate size and profile, and again, we're matching the profile of the bugs with those of our of our pattern. Um, I mean, T, T stands for trout feeding behavior. Trout are savvy investors. They're going to be focusing their energy, focusing their time, and where they're going to get the most calories back. And here we are entering the winter season. Most of our bugs have hatched, flown around, laying their eggs in the warmer summer and fall and spring months. And as these bugs start hatching from the eggs on the bottom of the river or the lake, they are teeny. They are size 32. They are size 28. They are size 22 uh, hooks. I mean, they are minuscule. There's not a lot of calories. 
And so, you know, trout aren't going to be, you know, fighting on the surface of the water chasing a dry fly in this season. Not only is there no, you know, very few if any dry flies, but the calories are small. They're on the bottom of the river. So, um, you know, we're going to be joining the trout where they're at. Trout are following the food throughout the day. And as a hatch starts, the trout will follow that hatch. So rarely, if ever, do you get to fish the same fly throughout the day, or rarely, if ever, do you get to go back to that same uh, river and fish the same flies with optimal success. The menu's changing. So we need to change with it. And the trout, the way they feed, tells us this is when you move from nymph to a merger. This is when you move from a merger to that dun mayfly breaking through the surface of the water. This is the cue that it's time to move from the dun to that spinner returning to the water to lay its eggs. For those of you listening that think I was just speaking in Greek, like what the hell is a dun? What's a spinner? Um, on our website, uh, we list the family species and life cycle of every single fly pattern. So you can search what's a blooming olive, what are the duns, and that's all kind of filtered out for you. But so trout feeding behavior. We get to a river, we sample above the water, under the water, over, you know, all around the river, but we don't see any trout breaking the surface of the water. Their feeding behavior tells us we're not looking for dry flies right now. Regardless to the terrestrials you saw on your truck or flying over the water, the fish aren't rising. They're still focusing beneath the surface of the water. So we would prioritize our under the water samples, our eddy samples, those early life cycles on the wet page on the left-hand side of the row. So midge larva, caddis larva, mayfly nymphs, stonefly nymphs, etc. Trout follow the food. So first cue that the menu might be changing is we have a few dimples as bugs start to leave the surface of the water. We start to see that really unique flight patterns of those different species. Um, and, you know, our different families of bugs will hold their wings. Our mayflies hold their wings straight up off their back like a sailboat. Caddis flies hold their wings like a little A-frame tent over their back. Stoneflies' wings are flat to their back as they're on the water. We see these profiles, and then we see the fins of the trout start to rise. They, um, they kind of porpoise, almost like jaws, right? You see the fins kind of cresting through the water, their snouts rolling through the water. That dolphin-like porpoising behavior is indicative of feeding on emerger patterns. So as they're porpoising and rolling, they're not uh they're feeding the top six inches of the water column and as these flies are struggling to break through the surface of the water they're feeding in that surface film so we go back to the wet page of our box we move our finger across that row to our merger patterns we might flip over the page of our box to our dry page and on that left hand side we might have some of those dry midge patterns that are breaking through the surface those mayflies that are emerging into that first dry life cycle, the duns. So we're fishing right in the film and right under it when we see that dolphin-like behavior. When fish audibly start sucking and slapping and grabbing dry flies off the surface of the water, this is when we shift to those fully emerged dry flies on the end of our, our dry fly rows. And so, yeah, fish are leading that dance. That's T, trout feeding behavior. We're following their cues. We're moving with them as they chase the food. C stands for color. Um, so we start off by getting close in size, color, and profile. And, you know, if you were just to pick a rock up off the bottom of the river, all of the bugs, as you look down at that rock, are going to look dark. They're brown. They're black. Um, but if you were to put those bugs in a little sample vial, little glass vial, full of water and you hold that up to the sun, the way that a trout is looking up off the bottom of the river into a blue Montana morning, you'll be able to see that all of a sudden that black mayfly nymph is now an opaque gray, or an actually it's a, it's a light olive color. So we get a really true color match. Um, but not only do we want to match that color and profile, there's a lot of food in the water. Um, when I do samples on the upper Arkansas River um, in the fall, there's about just looking at our blueing olive mayfly nymphs, one of our multitude of mayfly species, there's about 1,200 blueing olive nymphs per square meter on the bottom of the river. That's a small section of the river, and there's 1,200 of these, this one food group there. And so we need our flies to stand out from the herd. And so by incorporating a little glass bead or a little wire wrap or a little flashback, 
by adding those colors that's going to kind of give that fly the impression of being like a, you know, a wounded elk or a wounded zebra, an alpha predator, a wolf or a lion is going to attack that one that's outside of the herd. It's perceived as easy prey, trout are alpha predators. So by adding that flashback, that little bead, the little wire wrap, we create the easy prey, the vulnerable prey, and it's the nature of that trout. Yeah, definitely, um, you know, mayflies are on the menu, but this one is the easiest one to catch. So it's their nature to attack that one. So we utilize color. Close in color, add a little flash. And then H in hatch stands for half an hour. How long do we flog the water if we're not getting strikes, if we're not getting flashes, if we're not getting slime on our hands? Um, I say reassess your presentation first. I'm going to move my weights, my indicators. I'm going to uh, adjust my presentation and my drift 10 times before I change my flies. We have good data on the flies. User error is, is the most common uh, reason why fish aren't, aren't feeding. So um, if I'm doing all that right, I'll go back, reassess my sample, and then maybe change up some flies after half an hour. And I can attest to that, uh, changing the presentation over the flies, just a quick little side story that I had a couple of years ago with one of my friends. Um, we were fishing the same river probably, I don't know, 50 yards apart, and she was catching fish after fish after fish, and I was catching absolutely nothing, no strikes, nothing. And so I went over to her, and I was like, okay, let me know what you're doing. I'm going to match your rig exactly. So um, we put the same split shot on. We put the same distance between all the flies, set the indicator at the same depth, and I still wasn't catching anything. And I could not, for the life of me, figure out what it was. Then I changed my indicator color, and I immediately started catching fish after fish after fish. So something as simple yeah. as that for me, um, which normally, you know, I don't think too much about that. I'm, I'm more focusing on things like depth or how far apart the flies are, how much weight I have on. But in that case, um, even switching the indicator color seemed to completely change my luck. And when she tried the indicator that I had had on previously, she stopped catching fish. Absolutely. And I mean, that's the, the type of stuff that in, in our weekly articles and, and uh, videos that we do, we talk about fish fish and fish definitely see purple and red and green. So slapping down a, a yellow or a pink indicator, unless you're on a lightly pressured, you know, freestone big river, you're going to, you're going to scare every fish out of the tailwater. So clear indicators, yarn indicators, um, that's the way to go if, if you're fishing that, that style of rig. Yeah, I used to think it didn't matter too much, but now I, I just keep a handful of the, the brighter ones in case I'm ever fishing, you know, chocolate milk um, or, or yellow ones if it's, if it's really choppy. But I tend to just go with white and clear now because of that. And, you know, I don't know if it actually matters most of the places I go, but I figure it can't hurt. Yeah, no, I think, you know, you're going to catch more fish. Well, that's all super, super helpful. I feel like, uh, I still forget to do a lot of this stuff when I get to the water, especially being so eager to, to start fishing. But um, we'll link to to everything you mentioned there, both the uh, the fly resources, you know, talking about the different stages of the insects, as well as the uh, match and the pause method. So people can check that out because it's definitely something that uh, it, it's really going to be helpful to keep in mind when you're out in the water. Uh, but Excellent. Well, we, yeah, and I'm happy to be a resource. I mean, the phone number on the website rings through to my business mobile, and I, I encourage clients, like, you don't need to buy flies from me for intel. So give me a call. Give me a text. Text me a picture of a bug from the water. Text me a picture of your fly box. I'll tell you what it is in your box. Like, I want you to catch fish, and if you need flies someday, you know, we have them. But it's not, not necessary for me to help you out. Well, and that, that helpful attitude is a, kind of a great segue into what we're, you know, going to talk about for the rest of the interview, which is secret fishing spots, which is something that you had suggested to me as a topic. And I thought that sounds like a super interesting thing to talk about. Um, just kind of with the with the secrecy of, of people today, especially with social media and people just trying to keep their spots really close at hand. Um, and I, it, it sounds like your attitude toward it is, is that we need to be a little bit more open as a community. I think so. I think um, the future of the sport, I mean, not to sound dramatic, but the future of our sport and our, our fisheries is, is going to be, you know, inseparably tied to getting more people on the water, getting more people passionate about this sport. And, um, 
yeah, it's uh, in the age of social media, um, it, it's it's a it's kind of a tight tightrope to walk. Um, what do you share? What's too much? And and what do we need to do as a community to make sure that this is something that we and, and future generations can enjoy? Um, you know, my uh, my kind of mentality is is you can call me, uh, you can text me, and you know, email me and I will tell you, you tell me what species you want to catch. If you want to disperse camp, if you want to trek across the Western United States, I will drop pins across the U S and I'll tell you where to fish. Cause I want you to love the, the sport. I want you to connect with family and friends on the water. And I want you to be a lifelong angler that's going to contribute to this sport and to these fisheries and become an advocate. Um, you know, I recently I, I wrote an article and I, I called out three, um, you know, specific waters uh, here in the front range of Colorado that within an hour of uh, Denver where you can go and, and have a really good, you know, day, whether you're a brand new angler or uh, or a seasoned angler. I just want you to get out and, and have a great time and catch fish. And uh, on social media, I mean, all of our, we have a, an awesome, super engaged community of just very like-minded anglers that are passionate about sharing the sport and sharing the water. But uh, we had mentioned, uh, you know, Georgetown Reservoir. And uh, for those of you out of state, Georgetown is spitting distance from Interstate 70. Uh, it's, uh, you know, you, it's accessed through a, a condominium parking lot. It's wheelchair accessible. And uh, you're going to be sharing the water with just as many bait fishers and, and spin fishers. But everyone's catching fish. And it's, it's a great spot to go in the fall. And we had mentioned that. And uh, for the hundred good comments, we, we get a couple of the, those really loud voices from social media, like you are ruining the sport. You're, you know, you should do this on your own. Um, you know, you shouldn't be sharing this, you know, you have to work for it. And, uh, yeah, not only is that kind of ridiculous in this scenario, that's the, the topic that I want to share that I, I think those voices are doing more harm. Um, and so let's, let's engage that Kate. Let's, uh, let's talk about that. For sure. Yeah. And I, so I, my thoughts on this kind of go back and forth because on one hand, you know, I have some spots that are very near and dear to my heart and to, to see them, you know, flooded with other anglers, you know, potentially disrupting a very sensitive small fishery would be, you know, would, would upset me a lot. But at the same time, um, th- those spots that I have that near and dear to my heart are few and far between. And for the most part, the places I fish are are pretty well known. You know, it doesn't it's not rocket science to find out about a reservoir along I-70, you know, and right. I feel like a lot of the time on social media, I see people going a little too far with it, you know, like blurring out the background or, you know, geotagging a location that doesn't exist just to to remind people that they're hiding their spot versus just kind of discreetly you know, sharing a picture of a fish. And if, if people happen to recognize it, they can go fish there. And if they don't, then, you know, that's that. Yeah. And I agree with you on, on the sensitive places. I, you know, I don't think I've ever, you know, sent somebody to a place where there is a, a sensitive native uh, fish population. Um, you know, some of those places, I mean, they're going to be available, um, you know, on, on state maps and regs uh, for people to go to. But I mean, that's that's not typically the places where I'm, I'm sending a lot of these new anglers. Um, but again, if, if they want to backpack, I can say in this region there are these five lakes that can, you know, hold these fish and these sizes and these species, and these are the flies that are gonna gonna get it, you know, get you on them. So I mean, I, I can, you know, be a little more vague and, and give a region and, and uh, you know, uh, along the seven miles, there's a lot of good places where you can pull off and fish. Um, you know, the for those that say that you need to do this alone, I just think that that's a, a fallacy that that nobody fishes alone anymore. You know, we're not, you know, carving our way through the West on horseback and snowshoe. Like those days are done. Like you've either heard about this spot from a fishing buddy, you've seen it on social media, you've looked it up in, uh, you know, online. You know, where should I fish? What's going on in this region? Oh, there's this this creek or that creek. Um, or you call a local fly shop. I mean, we, we go to people we trust with the hope of being able to engage and, and feel that life and, and uh, joy on the water. So, um, I mean, it's, it's false to think that people find all these spots on their own. No one's actually doing that. And so 
again, we, I want to be someone that's, that's trustworthy, both in how I approach business and, and sell flies, but also you know, I'm going to lead, you know, my clients straight, but I'm, I'm not going to do something that's going to damage the fishery. What I, what I think will damage the fishery, I mean, or, you know, it's, you know, wipe out fly fishing is not sharing this sport, you know, being tight lipped or mean spirited, um, being a troll, you know, a faceless troll on social media and discouraging people is going to scare people away from the sport. And, um, I did a little research and I, I called up some friends at, uh, Colorado parks and wildlife and year after year, I mean, year over year over year, they're selling fewer fishing and hunting permits, um, each year. So as much as people say, Denver's getting so busy and the South Platte's getting so busy, we're actually selling fewer permits year after year than, than we did. So there's fewer anglers. And with that, I mean, my fear is that with fewer anglers, those are conservation dollars that are disappearing. Those are dollars that are going out of funds that, you know, the state uses to buy private land and make public and available. And those are dollars and those are votes that are not going to be there to protect these resources as people want to drill that land or they want to graze that land or they want to lease it for gold mining. We're going to lose our, our voice as anglers. We're going to u- lose our power as anglers unless we encourage and empower more people to engage the sport, to find this community, to be a part of this community and to be a responsible part of this community. So we need anglers. We need to embrace each other spin, bait, fly fishing, and engage this uh, together. And I think there's also a tactful way to, you know, for example, like I said, I have one or two spots that I, you know, those are those are the one or two that I will not share with people because either I've, I've learned about them through somebody else and I don't feel like it's my um, place to kind of give away that information to somebody else who might then share it again, um, or just extremely small, fragile populations of, of fish that um, I think could be harmed by, you know, having anglers come there. You know, apart from those, uh, you know, I'm I'm a pretty open book in terms of of where I can where I'll send people. Uh, but even even on those uh, ones that I'm a little bit more tight lipped about, I feel like there's a, a tasteful way of if someone asks to say, you know, this this spot is something I prefer not to share. But you know, if you're looking for something like that, then here's you know a spot you could you maybe want to try. You know, if if that species is important to you, then um, here's two or three other lakes that have that species or if you really want to get out and, you know, hike into the back country and be alone, um, here's a couple spots that might, that might interest you and will satisfy that need without necessarily giving away a specific area that, you know, could, could do without a ton of angler pressure. Absolutely. I, I couldn't have said it better. I think that is, I mean, that's what we, that's what we're all craving. And um, to, to have a, a community, be it online, that is respectful and empowering while protecting the resource, while respecting the, you know, the secrets of your, your friends or, or dad that showed you this spot. It's all right to have some of those spots. I mean, there are tens of thousands of miles of streams and rivers in Colorado and, you know, in every state. Um, so there's plenty of room to fish. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, you know, we, we do this because we find life on the water. We find hope and we are able to engage with our families and our friends in a different way. And we can turn off our cell phones and, I mean, it's, it's so precious to us. Um, I mean, the conversation I have with my kids, you know, when we, when we travel and we go to our fly tying factories, I mean, every day after school, I'm like, how do you use your blessings, your opportunities to bless the world? So let's, you know, embrace that. Um, this is something we love. Why don't you, you share what you love? And, uh, and other people will love it and protect it and share it as well. So another thing that I talked about recently on a, another episode that's about to come out um, is the idea of secrecy in the actual flies themselves, because that's something that I've never really understood. You know, say you're out on the water and, you know, someone comes up and asks what they're biting on. And I feel like today there's just a lot of, you know, people, people are a little turned off when you walk up and, and just ask that. And they, they act like you're asking them, you know, a very personal piece of information about themselves. And my thoughts, you know, with, with secret fishing spots, for example, like maybe you have one that you, you don't want to get too pressured but if you meet someone along the river and they just want to know what's working like there's really no downside to letting them know they're not going to catch all the fish in the river just because they you know know what fly pattern's working now and 
I've always been a little disappointed that that has become a little bit more taboo. You know, asking and sharing, you know, which fly patterns are working while you're standing next to somebody on the river. You know, and I agree with you. And I think it might seem more prevalent, but I I think that is the minority of people. Um, You know, gosh, you know, I I get this all the time. Like we can give like a hundred good comments on, on a post or a video or something, but it's the one negative comment that just really kind of pierces my soul. Mm-hmm. and just drains the joy out of me. And it's it's these few trolls. It's the few kind of elitists. And, and somehow I think, I mean, their their pride and their identity is tied into you catching more fish. And that's, that's fine if, if that's, you know, where you get your value. But, I mean, yeah, it's, I think, I think it's, it's benign. It's, again, for the good of the sport, for the life of these rivers. I mean, we need people to, to engage this. And what a, what a simple way to help someone else have a memorable day with their mom on the water or their friends or, you know, to catch that one trout that's just going to sustain them through, you know, the next six months of sitting in an office in the Midwest before they can head back to the mountains. So, you know, open invitation. I, I tell everyone this. You see my truck on the river? You are welcome to fish with me. And and I have about 5,000 flies on me. I will know what's working, and I will be happy to give you, you know, whatever I have in my box to make sure you have an awesome day as well. So that's the mentality that I hope, you know, your listeners embrace. And uh, they're going to catch more fish. They're going to have an awesome time, and someday they're going to be able to pass that on to someone else. Right, and I think there's something to be said about – you know, the satisfaction, like like we talked about earlier, when you get to the water and, and figure out what the fish you're eating based on what you've observed versus just being told. And I think there is something fun, especially for a lot of people who like to get out in the backcountry, is, is it's fun to try to find your own spots. Like maybe find a map and, and look for a lake that doesn't have a name and say, all right, my goal for next summer is to make it to this lake and to see what's there. Like I'm not going to look anything up. And I think that's, you know, that's a, a fun thing for people to do. And I encourage people to kind of learn to do that on their own because there is a satisfaction you derive from from doing the work yourself. But, you know, you can you can find 10 spots a summer doing that and still get help from your friends who, you know, say they went fishing somewhere and had a great day and they can tell you where they were. You know, it doesn't have to be mutually exclusive. Right. Well, and, and, and you and I might find a lot of joy from that, but I mean, this is, this is my profession. I live and sleep and fly fishing. So this is what I do is I find these spots and I, I, I work on these waters. But most of us, you know, or your listeners, you know, they're an accountant or they're a realtor or they are, you know, you know serving at, at a restaurant and they don't have the leisure to, to find all that. So maybe the way that, you know, they're like, I am craving just to get out and catch a fish. So how do I do that? Um, where can I go? And so, you know, if, if they need that hand, if they need that, that point to the water or, you know, some help with the flies, you know, maybe someday they can, you know, take on that grand adventure and find that spot and find all the bugs. But again, this is, this is something that they, they want to do for fun and want to learn. Um, we got to help them along the way and, and maybe they'll get there, but you know, maybe they won't. I'm just happy they're on the water. Right. And I think that it's nice to have, just have the mindset that there's such a spectrum of people out there too. You know, I mean, People want to kind of make fly fishing so categorized. You know, what kind of angler are you? Are you a are you a tankara fisherman? Are you a euro nympher? Are you a spay caster? Uh, and they forget that you know you can do all those things, and and you don't necessarily have to identify as any one. And I feel like that's kind of the same case here, where you know there are days where I just want to go out and catch a fish after work, and it doesn't really matter if I'm along the side of a road or. You know, if I'm surrounded by other people, like I just want to get out and catch a fish. And there's other days where I really value getting away from people and putting in a lot of miles and enjoying that solitude. And I have to remind myself that, you know, I don't need to identify as either one of those things. You know, I can I can enjoy all of them. And I feel like there's a lot of people out there who who would, you know, enjoy the service of just having someone give them information so they can enjoy their fishing and not have to spend all their time trying to fit into this, you know, category of someone who you know, really works hard and, you know, hikes 10 miles back. Yeah. Yeah. We're not all doing that. I mean, we, we supply the flies for, for Denver's project killing waters trips. And, you know, some of these guys have severe, um, you know, injuries, uh, you know, from their men and women from their time in the service. And I mean, they, they can't hike 10 miles back. 
you know, they're lucky if they can sit in a boat, you know, all day um, sometimes. So yeah, it's, uh, it's about being out there. It's about the relationships gathered or it's about solitude, make it what you want. Let's, but let's not, uh, let's not throw firebombs at people doing it differently than us. We need each other and, and the trout need more anglers. Otherwise there's not going to be money to stock the trout. There's not going to be money to protect these rivers. We, yeah, there's not a right way. It's uh, just, let's do it together and be kind. So do you get much blowback for a cent for, for giving out a lot of information? Periodically, again, it's um, people from outside of, of our community. Um, we have an engaged community that that cares about um, the people. I mean, above the spot, above the biggest fish. And so, um, you know, we have homeless youth that are working with us. And when one of them gets their first apartment, I'll put it out on Instagram. I'm like, hey, Matt and Stephanie just got a place. They need furniture within an hour. I mean, since our community is about the people as well as, you know, celebrating each other's successes, they're celebrating his success. And within an hour, we could have furnished five houses. So, um, you know, it's, it's the people that are from out of state. And again, it's, it's the loud trolls hiding behind uh, anonymity that, that feel like they can throw stones. Um, but, uh, yeah, it, it, it gets me down sometimes, you know, being real. But uh, it's, uh, you know, I'm, I'm committed to. Um, I think this is what's best for the sport and we're going to keep doing what we think is best and we're going to keep making it about, about the people. I mean, their first fish, the biggest fish, the, the trip of a lifetime hiking in what their goals are, are is, is our goal to make happen. And do you think that this is a product of social media specifically, just because, you know, I feel like before social media, you might have a spot that, you know, everyone would want to know about, but unless someone saw a physical picture you took, they wouldn't even know you went there. And now it's just, there's so much information online that, you know, you, you post one picture and you'll have people, you know, scouring the background and try to find out where you were and asking and sending you messages and everything. Um, do you think that that's solely a product of just the wide reach that people have these days? I think so. And I think, I mean, that, that may draw people to, to, I mean, just to some of these, you know, these spaces that you want to, you know, keep secret. I mean, I don't know. Um, social media has, has cast a light on the industry. And I think a lot of the things that are, are pictured in social media aren't the, the things that we need to be celebrating the most, like, you know, the, the biggest fish or, or something that's, it, it's, it's kind of a, a place where people beat their chest a lot to say how great they are. Um, I don't know. I mean, some of the, the people that I, I enjoy following the most, um, there's Trout Christie and, uh, Fly Messinger, those are uh, two local guides here. And I feel like, I mean, what they capture, they capture big fish, but they capture this interaction with nature and relationship and really capture that, that feeling of life more. Um, I mean, it can be a positive thing. Um, I mean, I think Landon Mayer is in, in Brazil right now, and the videos he's posting are, you know, you know, giving props to really cool anglers and, and people tying flies and just really capturing that community. So I think it can be a positive thing. Um, Again, it's it's a tricky balance. I, I don't know how to, to navigate it perfectly, but uh, again, I, I hope we can be civil and kind. And I really like your approach where you say, you know, this is a spot that was shared with me that I'm not allowed to share, but if you want that species or you're in this area, here's a couple other options that can be really fun. So that's empowering. It's not cutting people out. We need to break that stodgy, you know, tweed coat stigma of trout being a one percenter sport for old white guys. Like, Let's open it up. And like you said, it's I, it's hard to navigate and it's hard to really narrow down, uh, you know, one rigid set of rules for this. But I think that's that's a lofty goal that we don't really need to strive for, honestly. I think at the end of the day, if your goal is just to treat people well and, you know, generally be helpful when you can, then that, that kind of guides your decisions and – you know, it, you can use it specifically for each spot you're talking about, and that might be a different a different answer you give each time. But as long as your goal is to, you know, be as helpful as you can while while also respecting the resource, then you can't really go wrong. I agree. I agree. Well, do you want to um, just kind of end with a little plug for Ascent, um, where people can find you, and you know, if anyone else wants to reach out and kind of voice their opinions on this and any any ideas they have for kind of a productive conversation? 
Absolutely. I, I love to, to see some dialogue. So I don't know if there's ability to leave comments uh, uh, on the, the podcast page, but um, you know, anyone is welcome to to find us or reach out to me at Ascent and our team. We're online at ascentflyfishing.com, A-S-C-E-N-T, flyfishing.com. And again, all of our, an article a week, a new video, all the podcasts we've been on, just that stuff that's going to empower you to learn the science and fish it. It's all on there. Um, and flies are a buck to a buck and a quarter. So quality flies, 100% guarantee, you know, scientifically sound. And uh, yeah, we're ready to hook you up. We're on Instagram at Ascent Fly Fishing and, and Twitter at Ascent Fishing. Um, and you know what we're doing, um, it's not just trout porn. We're on the water. We're sampling the water. We're showing you what we're seeing. We're reading uh, the way fish are feeding, and we're translating that to, based on this, we're shifting to these flies. Based on this, we'd be fishing these. And so we're, we're applying the science, and we're trying to empower you with knowledge. That's what we're doing on our, our social pages. And, again, now they can my, my email's on there, my mobile's on there, and uh, we hope that we can be a resource. And we'll be traveling with uh, the fly fishing show this winter. So um, if people want to you know, attend one of our entomology classes in New Jersey, or uh, at the, um, oh gosh, it's, I'm trying to think where the fly fishing show is in Jersey. Um, but uh, we're there and, uh, and then we're Edison, New Jersey. And then we'll be in Pleasanton, California this year. Uh, we'll be at the Virginia wine and fly fishing show um, outside of Richmond. So yeah, we're excited. Um, and hopefully we get to meet a lot of you as we, we travel this winter. All right. Well, I really appreciate you coming on, Peter. I, I think this was a great combination of kind of some philosophical chat as, as well as some really hardcore tips of, of how to you know make people more effective when they get out on the water and, and don't really know what's hatching. So um, I really appreciate you coming on and, and chatting. Katie, thank you for having me on. I really appreciate it. All right. Take care. Bye, Lance. All right. And that'll do it. As always, if you liked what you heard, go ahead and go over to the Wild Initiative podcast. You can subscribe there and get my shows every Thursday, as well as all of Sam's other shows throughout the week. You can also find my episodes on fishuntamed.com, in addition to weekly backcountry fly fishing articles. And you can find me on social media at fishuntamed on Instagram or under my name, Katie Burgert, on Go Wild. And I will see you all same time, same place next week.